Hello everyone, I hope you are all enjoying your lunch. I'd like to take this time to introduce our keynote for today, um, Dr. A. Parikh. He will be speaking on the paradigm shift, a call for agility in higher, in higher education institutions. Uh, Dr. Parikh is a Shadowick Professor of Management and Leadership at Munford College at the University of Northern Colorado. Uh, his teaching research and consulting experiences span for over 25 years. He is the past provost and senior vice president of the University of Northern Colorado, Southern Utah University, and has over two decades of academic administration experience at the both public and private sector. So let's um, give a warm welcome to um, Dr. Reed. Good afternoon. Like Stephanie said, that the, I've been with the higher education almost my entire career for 32 years. Of those 32 years, I have been with the in administrative roles almost 28 of those 32 years. So, so I've seen ups and downs of the higher education from years of 2002 when we had the recession another recession in 2007, another one in 2009, and, and so on and so on. And in that capacity, I have always worked with the university resources and the changes that have taken place. So a little bit about my background, you can see my background is that from 1984 to now, except for a few years, I was a faculty member. I've been department chair, dean, Vice President, Vice Chancellor, Senior Vice President, Senior Provost, and so on, in almost three or four different institutions. So, so what's important is that, and, and, and also by the way, that those of you don't know me also that the, I was the chief editor of the, one of the journals for Clues for a number of years, uh, actually Journal of Business and Economic Research. Higher education is in turbulence. And in, in at least the United States. And this represents what we are doing in a higher education basis. What's going on is that constantly there are some paradigm shifts taking place in higher education. And, and what I'm gonna go through is some of the things that is going on, about three or four slides in terms of what is going on in higher education. Talk about a little bit about the complacency and, and agility issues in higher education. Then perhaps in the end offer some prescriptions that what we can do in higher education in the United States. If you know, I don't know how many of you play the whack-a-mole game. You know what I'm talking about? This is the kids that they play in the pizza parlors and places like that. Managing higher education is like playing a whack-a-mole game. Why? Look at the number of stakeholders we have. These stakeholders, every one of them, they are asking for something from you as an institution as a higher education institution. And at this time, also sometimes, their requests or their demand, they are at conflict with one another. Make sense? That means that if legislator wants something, faculty want something different, they're totally opposing to that. Or parents, or students, or community, or governing boards, and so on. You can see that how many masters we have in higher education in terms of uh, satisfying them. That makes managing higher education complicated. And believe me, being at the role of the just one position for the president, I have dealt with every one of these people. And it's like they're playing a maximum game because you're pushing one down, the other one pops up, basically. So, now, that gives you a pressure that you're under constant pressure, why? because technology demand, state funding, campus growth, all those things are squeezing you, and you have to navigate all of these at the same time, and making sure that you are successful as an organization in a sustainable way, and also you're growing, and also making sure that the quality of your education is stand up to the expectation of your students, basically. So, now I'm gonna go talk about the landscape shift, and there's about three or four slides. I'm gonna go through them, and, and, and by the way, if you wanna talk or ask questions or whatever, I will be more than happy to respond. We'll have some time in there. 
First of all, I don't know any of you coming from the United States public institutions. It used to be the public institutions budget covered 60 to 70 percent by the state. Nowadays, that has reduced to less than 30 percent. That means what? At the same time, your cost is escalating. At the same time, the state support or taxpayer support for education is coming down. That means what? That means that tuition has to go up. And that also becomes an issue with the legislators because they don't like tuition go up. And the parents don't like it. And the students don't like it. That's another dichotomy that you have to deal with, basically. So, for example, in Colorado, this last budget cycle, the state of Colorado legislators, they told institutions that if you raise your tuition more than 3%, we're not going to give you a budget. So the state institutions, they have done what? They have done in this quid pro quo game, basically. You cut the cost down, you reduce your um, tuition increases, then we'll give you funding at the request that you have and so on. Cost of delivery at the same time is going up. Why? Because technology, state support cutting back, deferred maintenance in many, deferred maintenance in the maintenance of the uh, buildings, facilities, and whatever, in most institutions, deferred maintenance has exceeded more than 100% of the annual budget of the institution. That means buildings are old, crumbling, and whatever, and it requires what? Refreshing, rebuilding, and so on, but there is no funding that's coming down, basically. The students and parents' expectations are changing. The students like, I don't know how many of you in higher education, you have to come up with the plush dormitories, for example. Dormitories that has a pool table, has this, and poker table, and things like that. That electronically, there's a cost up there, for example, that how much you have to put in that building to make sure there's a uh, no money type technology exists, so they can charge their credit card, basically. Parents, at the same time, they are asking for return on their investments. Why I should pay higher education that much money if my kid cannot graduate on time or graduate and find a job appropriate to their degree programs? That's another challenge. Parents are now more of the, have you heard of helicopter parents? Parents are more engaged in the education of their kids. That means they are constantly monitoring higher education institutions, kids' progress, faculties, credibilities, and so on and so on, and that's another challenge, basically. Technology. Nowadays, most institutions, they have what they call phasing out of their technology every two, three years. They are delaying that to four years or whatever, but we're finding out, in some cases, students coming to the colleges, universities, that have better technology than what the university has. That is putting an extra pressure on the higher education institutions to, what? to upgrade, enhance, replace the old technology. Another issue is that the maintenance and security cost issue. Because of the hacking and things like that, there's a lot of money being put in the technology to what? To make sure that it's secure. And at the same time, how many of you use Blackboard, Canvas, and all those learning management systems? Every one of those are costing a lot to maintain and get a license, basically. Okay, that's another paradigm shift. Open access online course delivery. We have right now free online courses by private and public universities. They are competing with you. They are coming out from a very prestigious university. There's a massive open online courses exist. There's explosion, basically. Expectation of the asynchronous and synchronous degree, that means most universities now, they cannot afford to not have online presence of their degree or courses, basically. Okay, that means what? That means paying for the faculty development course, paying for technology course, and so on and so on. That is another thing. State expectation has changed because they are mandating a lot of things without funding. <laughs> Those are called unfunded mandates, basically. Degree completion benchmarks. Now states are saying that you have to, what's your six years graduation rate? What's your retention rate? What's this, what's that? And they are measuring your performance and your 
they are aligning that with the budget for the for the budget appropriation. Graduation benchmarks, retention benchmarks, and so on. Now, believe me, I have dealt with all of these myself in my career for the last 20 some years. Competitive pressures. Community colleges, they are getting into four-year degree programs. So, online private and public online for-profit or non-for-profit type of the competition coming from the uh, higher education institutions, basically. And at the same time, you, in order to make sure that they, you can sell your product to the potential student and family, you need to show that you have a specialized accreditation you have, you have a regional accreditation, your degree of value to the student and their parents. Leadership. Right now, tenure of every president is about five or six years. Why? Because there's expectation of that leadership to do what? Raise money. Actually, nowadays you are seeing that more and more presidents are being hired that they have no background in academies. They are legislators, they are CEOs, and so on and so on, because the role, traditional role of the president that used to be a basic statesman of the academy has changed. It become more of a salesperson. Okay, that is another challenge, for example. Fundraising, fundraising, and so on, and then we see that all of these are changing the way that the almost higher education becoming a corporate higher education. <coughs> Corporate universities, more and more companies, they are coming up with their own university after. Motorola has it, not for all of them. And that means what? Well, because they are saying that I want it, I know what my people need to have rather than you telling me what they should have. Remember, think about this. In higher education, when the student comes to our classes, we don't ask them what do you need to learn. We tell them what you should learn. Is that right? That's our curriculum. But the corporate university is changing the paradigm and saying that I'm going to teach you what you need to know to do your job. That's a competition itself. So they do what they call inward versus outward. And demographics of the higher education changing. They are asking when to learn, how to learn, where to learn, what to learn. We never had this before. So, we're in the crossroad. We either have to follow the tradition, or because of the paradigm shift, we innovate. That's the only choice we have. Because without innovation, we're gonna go through the slow what? demise as a higher education institution. So, this is a quote from Danger Minds. It says, the tragedy of life is often not in our failure, but rather in our complacency. Not in our doing too much, but rather in our doing too little. Not in our living above our ability, but rather in our living below our capacities. Now, how many of you, if you can show me the hands that you serve in more than one or two or three committees. <laughs> Academic committees. Do you accomplish anything? Do you? Yeah, but for example, it takes, I remember I was a provost of an institution, they wanted to change the general education. It took about seven years and I <laughs> left and still they were working on it. Okay? Because why? Because this pro mentality that we have, sometimes referred as Somalian warlords, basically. Why? Because everybody wants to protect their own turf. And as a result, what's happening is that higher education is becoming very slow churning. We can't move fast. We are not agile. And we're losing as a result of that. <laughs> So, complacency, definition of complacency, can be a well-hidden leadership sign of an underperforming culture. Complacency is defined as self-satisfaction 
especially when accompanied by an awareness of actual dangers of efficiency. That means we're very content with who we are, and we don't want to listen to anybody as academy. Again, I'm one of you guys too. I'm not just blaming anybody. I'm a product of that same academy. <clears throat> so, what are the warning signs? See if any of these apply to some of your institutions. A sense of satisfaction, especially success driven satisfaction. We're doing good, we don't need to change. A feeling by your team of what we are doing all we can. Repetition of time-worn performance behavior rather than innovating new performance behavior. Like look at our promotion and tenure, for example, process. Pretty much the same thing for the last so many years has not changed. You can hire as assistant professor, you're on a tenure track, they expect you to teach, have a good teaching evaluation, few publications, serve a few committees. As long as you don't rock the boat, you become associate professor, you become a tenure, and so on and so on. This has been going on for 20 some years that I have been with the higher education. Has not changed. Push back or disbelief in the possibility of the greater outcomes. Protection of current status rather than advancing the new position. Those are all the signs of a warning signs of a complacency. Now the reason is that because I publish in, in organizational agility, organizational complacency, and so on and so on. And you can even relate to some of the performance of the higher education institution, some of the organizations that they have disappeared in the marketplace. How many of you just know that if you're from the United States or whatever, that for example, Sears, Sears Robot, after how many years? They're no longer there. Circuit City, Radio Shack, and so on and so on and so on. Why? Because of complacency. Failure to innovate. And a higher education could be there if the states start cutting back, cutting back, cutting back, then we have to raise and raise, raise and tuition, and pretty soon we're gonna run out of the market, basically. That's the paradigm shift that you're seeing. Look at how many of these comments you have seen. Above the level, the iceberg, this is what we say we do, but the below the iceberg, see how many things we say that. We've done it this before, it won't work here, and so on and so on. You see that? We hear that all the time. Believe me, I work with the presidents even, and deans and whatever, that every time you suggest something, say, oh, we tried that before, it won't work here. We cannot do it, it won't work here, that will not do, for example. We are different. Okay, these are common. So look at it below the iceberg. This is what goes on in most of the complacent organizations. Even though we claim that we are at the higher education. So, what's the complacency effect on processes, people, structure, culture? Look at the processes. Environmental scanning, we don't do it. We don't even, some institutions they don't even look at to see what other institutions they are doing. We just teach the same degree program, same curriculum, tweak a little bit and whatever, but we're not inventing anything new, basically. Unable to react to external changes. Inadequate decision making process. That's a process. People, little accountability. Justification for retaining leadership. Unreliable, unperforming, unsuitable leadership. Whether it's a department chair, or a dean, or provost, or president, doesn't matter. The structure becomes what? Becomes cumbersome, bureaucratic, levels of management, and so on. In fact, there was a study I was looking at that a few, few months back. Now, between 2006 or 2004 till 2011 or 12, number of non-instructional professionals has surpassed number of instructional faculty. That means what? We created more and more layers of the people as part of administrative roles in the organization, but and it starts to increase the cost, but the delivery and the money generating 
performance area has shrunk actually, which is the faculty side. Culture, risk aversion. Okay, that's complacency. Because avoiding uncertainty, just sticking to what you know and keep doing the same thing. Rules and putting a lot of rules and procedures in place. Why? Think about this. The more committees, the more rules, the more procedures, the more shared governance you do, then it's going to delay what? Decision making. True? And procedure, standard, and whatever is not challenging. So, this is the diagram that actually I teach in my graduate class. Look at the, what happens to organizations that they are disappearing. They go through these five stages. This is from the book by Daft, is an organizational theory class. Look what's going on. Most of the time, organizations that they face decline, they get blinded. That's the first stage. That means everybody's doing something, you don't know really what's going on. Why? Because you're not doing environmental scanning. Then second is that, that means what? You don't do anything, inaction. By the time you wake up, you do something rush, and it's a faulty action. And then crisis hits in, and then dissolution takes place. This is a typically demise of the organization, like Sears or whatever I was talking about, that has gone through. And believe me, we study all those uh, organizations and, and they have gone through these type of stages. But if you look at the red line over there, you can see that prompt action, current action, effective reorganization or whatever, they keep you what? Sustainable over time as an organization. So, <laughs> we can't put head on the sand, is that right? Yes. So it's time for paradigm shift. Now, agility. Organization agility is the capacity of an organization to rapidly change or adapt in response to changes in the marketplace. That means what? We don't just take our time and study it by committees for 20 years. Market changes, we need to react to it fast. If we don't, we snooze, we lose, basically. <coughs> That's today's game. So, we need to change. Embrace change. Okay? We cannot continue doing what we did because higher education, academy has changed. So, what are the economic drivers that they're asking us these days? Headcount and FTE enrollment. Institution now living and dying by these numbers. Is that right? I'm sure you have heard, if you're in any role at the university, enrollment drives the agenda. Why? Because that's where the money coming from. Because the state's cut back. Retention rate. Freshman to sophomore, sophomore year, what's your retention rate? You have to publish that. It's highly selective institutions, they're at 80s and 90s. Most institutions average, they're at the upper 60s or low 70s, basically. That means, Six or seven out of ten students, they return the second year. Okay? I don't know if you've heard that old time, old days, you say that they look at your right side and left side, they're not going to be here next year. Similar things is going on. Why? Because they get washed out. Faculty credentials. Oh, I'm sorry. Time, time to graduation. What's your six year graduation rate? We have to publish that now. That's it, again, economic is right. We never did this before. Now we have to publish it to the public, not just ourselves. <coughs> faculty credential, what percent of your faculty have a PhD or terminal degree, for example? What's the percent of full-time faculty, part-time faculty? What's the teaching load issues, and so on and so on. The student to faculty ratio, because accreditation agency, they're asking for that like in NK, WCSP, ABIT, and others and so on, they're asking for these. What's the average class size? What's the tuition and fees for all, for example? Instructional cost per FTE undergraduate graduate, for example. 
program delivery and support costs. You'll receive overhead costs, ratio of instructional faculty, non instructional employees. These are the drivers that they are being asked institutions to respond to legislators, donors, and, and public. That's accountability issues. We never did this before 20 years ago. We didn't care, who, nobody cared what we do. But now has changed. That's a paradigm shift. So pressure to become agile. The state institutions, they have to play like a private ones. No longer they can rely on state money. That means customer service. That means making sure that you provide the best dormitories, residence halls, best football team, best volleyball team, and so on and so on, to just recruit students and retain them. The student recruitment, retention, quality of academic, student support services, compensation model, all has to be what? Competitive. Or you cannot recruit a student or faculty. Nowadays, for example, I don't know in different countries or whatever, in US, some business faculties, some engineering, nursing, and they are pushing hundred plus thousand dollars for nine months. Okay, for nine months. That means that you have to, in order to become break even, you have to have enough students in the class to make sure what? You cover the cost of instruction plus overhead. Basically. Need for the state of art and friendly degree programs. You see that enrollment in some of the traditional degree programs are declining. Not that they are bad degree programs, but academy, higher education, and states and jobs and employers becoming almost vocationalized. If you have a degree in English, for example, or history, or, or whatever, you can't find a job now. You have to do what? You have to go get a master's degree. Or change your major to something else at the graduate level or whatever. So we're seeing that it's taking place. Facing another, another uh, becoming agility is that as an academy, and I'm part of it also, we never saw a degree program we didn't like. <laughs> is that right? How many of you from your institutions have seen the program that they've been cut? We never cut anything. We just add. True? Mm -hmm. That means what? That means that marginally enrolled programs, they are draining the resources, and you won't have enough resources to what? To plug into their promising degree programs. So you're trapped, basically. Elimination of duplicate courses. If you look at most institutions, if you look at their catalogs, they, have, they cover economics in business school, economics in the arts and sciences, for example, and so on and so on. There's so much duplication going on, why not just offer one course and offer to all the degree programs, basically, as much as possible. cross utilization of academic courses and faculty are expected. We are extremely parochial to our discipline, extremely parochial to our college. We don't want to teach in another college, we don't want anybody else teachers in our college. We are extremely protective of that. And that won't work in higher education anymore. That's a paradigm shift. So, what's a prescription? So, we need to overcome resistance. How to overcome resistance? By engaging all the stakeholders. We need to communicate to faculty, the staff, administrators that why we need to change. We need to articulate with dollars and senses why we need to change. Consolidate colleges sometime to what? To eliminate administrative overhead. <laughs> We've never done that. Reduce graduation requirements. Right now, some states they are pushing for 90 credits as a bachelor's degree, as opposed to 120 credits. That means you get bachelor's degree in three years. But can we eliminate any course from our curriculum? <laughs> we never do. We just add another three credits. 
offer online degree programs that students can take anywhere, any place, basically. Even right now, the institution that I used to be provost, now I'm back to faculty, we still in our college, for example, we have some faculty that think that online is bad. We still do. Because they think online means less quality. In fact, if those of you taught online, it's much difficult to teach online. I've taught it, and I still do. Embrace competency-based education. We never gave credit to people for life experience before. Somebody coming in has had his own business for three years, but we tell them, you have to take principles of management. Okay? So we need to change that model to what? Attract more students and also give credit for their life experiences. Incorporate intersection of technology, content, and pedagogy. That means what? We create this online programming or whatever that has a good content, pedagogy, and so on. We need to bring down the silos and design interdisciplinary degree programs. We have less and less interdisciplinary degree programs. And re-engineer processes to rapid turnaround and adaptation. Build a culture of accountability assessment. When you're saying that I'm a good program, show me how you think. Have you heard of any degree program saying I'm a bad program? <laughs> Never. True? Meet or exceed the stakeholders' expectations. Curb costs to make your education more affordable by some of the strategies we talked about. Secure alternative source of funding. Embrace the culture of accountability. Articulate the value of higher education. Offer industry required curriculum, not because of what you like, what they like to hire. That's a difference. Recruit competent, skilled, and experienced administrators. So, embrace diversity of students. Our country, the US Act, has become more diverse. Minorities, more women, in fact, woman enrollment surpassed the male enrollment in almost across the nation. Okay? So we need to embrace that. We need to have a policy that makes them what feel comfortable in the institution, even though they are their minority status. Address the demographic of students changing. Continuously do environmental scanning. That means like a radar. Constantly look at to see who else doing what. Design feedback models to identify where are the intended performance was, what's the actual performance, and to conduct the gap analysis, basically. Engage stakeholders as possible, as many. Reward high performers encourage risk taking, and partner with key institutions to share ideas and resources. Like airline does, airline does alliances, we never work with another institution. So, Bill Gates says success today requires the agility and drive to constantly rethink, reinvigorate, react, and reinvent. Many of these are unknown for higher education now. We don't. And that's the result that higher education, the paradigm shift that has taken place, higher education, they need to change their way in order to meet or exceed the stakeholders' expectations today. So, look at the Dilbert here. It says here, our strategy is to be nimble and agile. Somebody asks, do other companies have a strategy of being clumsy and slow? And they ask him, how did the new strategy rolled out? They say they ruined it with questions. That's what's going on. And thank you. I'll be more than happy to answer a few questions or a few suggestions. 
to improve the presentation or things that I didn't cover. Believe me, I can talk forever as a provost. <laughs> so. Anyway, so I have a question. So many people here are very interested in how promotion and tenure uh, might evolve over time, given that it hasn't very much. Um, in the institution of the future, what will promotion and tenure look like? To be honest with you, there are some states that they are in fact questioning the concept of tenure. They are saying that they, because, because honestly, and I'm a tenured, I've been tenured in three different institutions. They, they, what they are saying that the intent of the tenure originally was academic freedom. You start from Great Britain, basically that means you can talk against the administration or the politics or whatever without fear of the retribution. However, <laughs> unfortunately some of our colleagues that move to becoming more of a job security in a sense. And, I, and basically that means what? You can't do anything to me because I have a tenure. Okay, I think that's shifting. More and more you see that the number of adjunct faculty, part-time faculty, is increasing and the percentage of the tenure track faculty declining because of many reasons. For a number of reasons, cost-wise, the benefits that you have to pay, and also you don't have to tenure them. In fact, sometimes the instructional faculty is not even part-time, you're hiring them for three years, four years, five years, and basically you hire them one year probationary, then they give them a three-year contract. That means after three years, if they're not working, you can easily what? Get them out. So we're seeing that is that trend is going on. Although AUP, American Association of University Professors, and a faculty and whatever resisting to that, that they are whatever, but reality of the life is that, that that's going to take place. Because they, oh, the largest cost of the most institution is what? Personnel. Especially the faculty. It seems to me like your number one customer, people you should be partnering with are the high schools, since these are the kids coming to you. What is it, and a lot of us here are high school teachers who are here for the conference, what do you see as us supporting you or looking to do in, in moving forward? Well, there's two things going on. I'm from, at least in the US, I know from Europe, you guys are from Canada, but, but at least in the US, High schools has become more of a time, seed time, as opposed to competency. Parents are expecting the high schools basically to what? To push the, the uh, from ninth grade, to 10th grade, and whatever. So, so that's one challenge we have. And that's one of the reasons that when the, any of the students coming to the universities, they can't cope with the expectation of the college, for example. That's one issue. And other things also we are seeing that some institutions, they have incorporated the what they call early college programs, meaning that they are joint or dual degree type, dual enrollment they call it, that either because of AP credits or things like that, or they are taking college credit while they are in the um, uh, high school. And we're seeing that more and more students coming in with a good number of credits, some of them 50 credits, some of them 15 credits, but they are doing that. But there has to be a partnership, that's why I talked about the partnership. It, when I was provost in uh, Colorado, I brought the <coughs> superintendent and the faculty of the uh, deans of the community college and us to talk about one another. But again, academic uh, complacency or slow churning doesn't matter in the school system or because you guys have your own challenges also in terms of school politics and things like that. Higher education, I'm the same. And it just makes it very difficult to create that type of a seamless process. But we definitely have to work together. And that's why I said partnering with other institutions to, uh, to, for resources, for ideas, and things like this. Because uh, those, uh, we see that the number of students coming in unprepared. They don't have any understanding of how higher education works, for example. And, and the parents are more concerned about their students playing football than they're getting a good degree, basically, in the high school. And, and so the parents has to also adjust to that expectation. I remember in the, a few years back, uh, high, uh, the school system was trying to change their curriculum and increase the number of math requirements or whatever. Parents were fighting. Parents were fighting. 
which I, I, it is kind of a dichotomy because I want my kid to get very educated, but I say, no, don't raise the math requirement, don't raise this requirement or whatever because, but don't cut back the football team. And that's the challenge. So I, I, think, I think we have to really reevaluate ourselves at different levels. And, and or are we going to be a dinosaurs? Flexible degree in what matter? For example, like take whatever you want and things like that. Well, online offers that option right now. In an online course delivery, because you don't have to be exactly four years or whatever. And they, they, but even federal government has to react to that. They are not. For example, financial aid is a good example of financial is saying that you have to have full time status, for example. Or you have to have so many credits and whatever. I don't believe in our federal requirement, and not just the state has kept up with what's going on with the market situation. Many of our students, 90 some percent of our students work outside the campus, okay? And, and also they are coming sometimes from a first generation of students. That means they have to pay for their college by working. Now they can't carry a full-time load. That means they have to take six credits here, two credits there, and so on, but then they get in trouble with the financial aid. Well, the six-year graduation rate is a, what is used in the U.S. as a as a benchmark. That what is the student coming in as a freshman? How many of them graduated after six years? Basically, why six years? They just use that because students sometimes they uh, fail degrees or fail programs or they step out or whatever. So six years the benchmark has been used by the state departments and things like that as a as a benchmark. So they made it a six year graduation. But again, that I don't know, that might be good for traditional students, but for non-traditional students, that might not be applicable. Because non-traditional, that they are working, supporting family, or things like that, they can't finish in six years. Some of them longer than that. However, some institutions, they have these rules that after so many years, your degree program is no longer valid, or so many courses you have to repeat again, and so on. That's become the other issue. Stephanie, you keep telling me it's over, but I'm answering questions. <laughs> well, um, we have some workshops that need to get started, but okay. those of you who have soft questions for Abe, he'll be here for a Yeah, I'll be here tomorrow also. And yeah. I'll, I'll so he will be around, um, but if we can get going to uh, get the workshops. Well, thank you again. Um, <laughs> see you